Fatherhood is the most difficult thing I've done in life. After 11 years, some days, I still feel like I don't have a clue. The game changes every day, and sometimes by the hour. So how do other guys do it? I'm Brett Farrell, and in this series I'll be talking with other fathers to see how they navigate this thing called fatherhood. In this episode, I'll be talking to Christian Elliott, the Global Director of Development for A21, a non-profit organisation that works to fight human trafficking in 14 countries. We'll be talking about divorce, dating and doing it all again. The hardest thing in fatherhood is changing a really dirty nappy. But you went back for more. (laughs) That's love. I know, it is. It is completely. Marrying young, his first marriage ended in divorce. And instantly, he was a single father and primary carer of two young children who were in primary school. How did you go about dating again? I I made terrible mistakes, to be honest. The first person that I brought into my life was more a passionate endeavour, may I say. (laughs) (laughs) Christian is now married to Shabo. They live in London with their two toddlers, Joseph and Elijah, as well as Alicia and Harrison from his first marriage. When you say to them, we've decided to get married, does that alter the dynamic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a few few, things. It's fascinating. It's it's sort of tips and troughs. You know, you've got this, yeah, Dad, she's great. I really like her. And then you say, I'm going to get married. And then the tears come. Well, what about me? We recorded this interview while they were on holidays in Sydney in their hotel room by the harbour. If you listen closely, you'll hear the sounds of the busy ferry terminal, the city and even the boys. Whether you're a father in the first phase or the second phase, it makes no difference. The first phase is about testing, for want of a better word, your own wineskin, your own who you are, your ability, what you stand for, what you're capable of. You're listening to Fatherhood with Brett Farrell, and here's Christian Elliott. Christian, thanks for coming. Pleasure. I know a lot of guys would be very, very reticent to ever go back to the younger years again, the nappies, the crying, the tantrums, trying to help little people become beautiful people. Why did you go back again? I went through a, uh, a divorce and, you know, when you start again, I, ha- I kind of had this choice, I kind of thought about this. I'd either find a person who was willing to not have children and, uh, and actually, to be honest, I did meet somebody like that who was quite happy to, to be married and not have kids. But if you're going to be with somebody, um, first of all, it's very natural for that person as a woman to want to have a child. And I think it's just a natural expression of your love for that person. Although I flirted with the idea of, you know, having a, a wife that never got pregnant, it was never realistic. Right. And so, you know, when, and when you fall in love, I think the natural thing, well, at least for me, is to is to have a baby with that person. So it was always on the cards when I got married to Shabo, my wife, to have children. You mentioned you got divorced. Mm. What was it like having to tell your kids from your first marriage that you were separating? Awful, yeah. Probably the most difficult time of my life. Telling them is one thing, then the aftermath of that is the other. They were eight and ten. Did you have to tell them? Yes, it was a bit of a, it was a little bit of a slow burn. We had a separate, a period of separation. It doesn't matter how old you are. If you find out that your parents are divorcing, it stops you. It collapses everything that you know to be true, and you wonder how things will ever work out. It will never be the same. Until now, I'd never thought how hard it would be as the parent having to tell the kids and the family and friends. As a father, you're guilty. You feel guilt for your kids. And um, I remember the sense of guilt, shame. And I used to walk around with my stomach in knots just thinking about it. So as a natural remedy to that, I would do everything I could to make them comfortable, which (laughs) in hindsight, you know, I probably went too far. And I don't necessarily think that's a good response, but it's a natural response. Yeah. So how did your kids take it? What was their reaction? Uh, Both very different. So my son... Harrison, he was a little bit younger, but he didn't show any emotion at all. Not in front of me. I found out afterwards he would sometimes cry, but he didn't do that in front of me. Alicia, on the other hand, would kick and scream. (laughs) She's quite feisty, so she's she was she's super vocal about how she felt. Divorce doesn't just affect the family. 
but also friendships, his friends, her friends. And when you attend the same church, it can be tricky with people not knowing what to say, or some saying too much. There comes a point where it all settles down and people choose sides, even if only through circumstance, but until then, like all uncomfortable situations, I never know where to look. The sad thing about divorce and when people break up is that, you know, there's a lot of hurt, a lot of angst, a lot of pain. People, there's definitely stigma attached to divorce. It's not a pleasant experience by any stretch of the imagination. It was tough, you know, and I think as somebody who also attends church, you're part of a little community of people who, and everybody knows you. And, you know, I was quite well known in the church, you know, was with the music team and getting involved with the charity sector seemingly doing good in the world and uh, you know I think people thought oh he's a he's a do-gooder but he can't take care of his family that was the uh, (laughs) that was the response I got actually by some and of course there are beautiful wonderful people in the world who don't think like that although there was this obvious uncomfortable stigma I chose to just dig my heels in and carry on I didn't leave my church carried on kept going kept seeing the same people and actually over time everything was fine it just took a bit of time for people to adjust to the fact that I was now single how did you go about dating again I, I made terrible mistakes to be honest in that the first person that I brought into my life was more a passionate endeavor May I say, <laughs> um, uh, didn't wasn't thinking with my my head. I don't think <clears throat> having made these mistakes, and the first one was a very strong woman uh, who who took a lot of a lot of my time and attention, and then I ended that relationship because I saw that my children were very unhappy. I then found somebody else who was the opposite subservient would you know would do everything I wanted you know pack my bags buy me clothes whatever it was very nice and everything but it was just too nice I remember waking up one day thinking goodness me you don't know how to pick the right person (laughs) honestly and and actually I was watching my children and I just saw the dynamic was all wrong and it really bothered me as a father and I tell you what Brett what I did is I decided that I would not be with another woman that was my decision and uh, and I was single for without anybody for for a little not that long I must admit but it was a good six months but I was I was committed to never having another relationship again longest six months of your life then is what I'm thinking. <laughs> <laughs> well unfortunately yeah I'd never I'd because I got married so young I'd never really been on my own but I, but those six months were really important because it, it helped me to reflect on what was important it had to be the family unit it came back to that I've always wanted a family right from the very beginning but then when I went through this sort of dark desperate time of not knowing what I wanted and then feeling like I had this sort of epiphany revelation of what a woman is in a man's life in relation to being a father because that's obviously very important I'm I'm not a single guy I I don't I come with baggage it's very important that I made the right decisions and I didn't want to go into another marriage and make mistakes uh, like I had before and I blame myself honestly my attitude my my youth you know they say that was it George Bernard Shaw said that youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I'd, I'd love to go back and change the way the way I was, but um, you can't. And um, so it was very important the second time around I didn't make the same mistakes, that I wasn't the same person, and I needed to go into a new relationship as a father with a new set of principles. How did Shabo come into your world? She, does she almost have to tell you, mate, I'm the one for you, wake up to yourself? You know, I've known Shabo for, what, 15 years prior to getting married? I mean, she was in the choir. I didn't, I didn't really know her that well. I just, I remember seeing her. She was Miss Australia, nine, uh, 2002. And I remember coming to London with her twin sister, and I thought, wow, these guys are gorgeous, you know. We never went any further than that, but, you know, we, I sort of nervously said hello a few times, but that, but that was about it. And then, you know, over the years, we just, we had the same circle of friends, and it was like, hello, and it didn't really get beyond small talk ever. I wonder when you get to that age where you know yourself, does dating get any easier? I can't imagine it would. Yet, even if it bothered Christian, he kept focused on his future happiness. When you say to them, Shabo and I are getting married, we've decided to get married, Hmm. does that alter the dynamic? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. There's a few few, things. It's It's sort of tips and troughs. You know, you've got this 
yeah, Dad, she's great. I really like her. And then you say, I'm going to get married. And then the tears come. Well, what about me? Particularly from the age of 16 onwards, as any father would know. And if you're, if you're getting prepared for that, you, you really need to batten down the hatches because 16 is uh, it's something else. Actually, 15 is something else. <laughs> and um, oh, no. I, nervous laugh, sorry. But, you, you know, uh, I think it all happened around that time when the hormones were raging and she's my only daughter. And so the, the inclusion of another woman where daddy's affection is going to go away or seemingly from her perspective away from her onto another person is devastating and I and I could see it on her face and she was wrestling continually with oh it's really good for my dad I really like Shabo but what about me you know am I going to still be his princess and blah blah and it, it went back and forth for a long time and went back and forth to the point where there was tension between Shabo and Alicia and the tension was tangible and I was in the middle all the time and I could do nothing right, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> no. <laughs> and so I spent a good year being piggy in the middle. And I saw the tension rising one day. I could see it happening and ordinarily I would step in, calm it all down, fix it all. And this time I decided not to. They both went upstairs and suddenly I hear this screaming. <laughs> And my daughter's screaming, and I hear my wife screaming. And they're both screaming at each other. But it was magic, because that, all the tension went away. It then ended up in a discussion, and then they understood each other really well. And from that day, it's, it's, there's, a lo there's a love, a mutual love there, there's no tension. And what I would say to anyone where, where you're in that situation, where you feel like you've got to manage your new wife and your child, sometimes you need to step out of the situation and let them deal with it, rather than avoiding the conflict. Conflict avoidance in that situation is the worst thing you can do. Unless you want to be a nervous wreck and take on the whole thing yourself, you know, you can, but it's, it's not very pleasant, trust me. <laughs> You've said a few times Shabo is a friend to the children. Yes. What about mother and discipline to the children, for, like, for, to Alicia and Harrison? How does that work? Does she leave that to you? Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is a bit, not, by and large, Shabo has been very careful about how she does that. She does it not as a friend or a peer, she does it as an, an auntie as opposed to a mother. You don't want to be a best friend, you don't want to be, you don't want to be a peer because then that's too over familiar, but you do need to be a person of authority. So she maintains the authority and so she will say, can you, can you do this, can you clean this, are the basic things. And then if, if, if Alicia is doing something that may be slightly inappropriate like all teenagers do like wear the shirt that's a skirt that's too short which she likes to do um shirts that are too short <laughs> the whole Skirts bit right. are too short shorts that are too short yeah yeah the old midriff and all that she'll that she'll say something you know but she'll say it in a loving kind just calm way she never snaps at them so it's, it's a discipline it's more like a guide again that that thing the notion of a guide who's there as the adult uh, not a best friend. Just bedding down this new family dynamic, it's fantastic. Finally the tension's gone, finally everything's starting to get how you probably hoped it would be. Yes. You're going to have two more kids. Hmm. How do you break that into the new dynamic? Well, yeah, then there's the next le that's the next level. So, you know, once we've dealt with the interpersonal tension between my wife and my daughter uh, yeah the next thing was she was pregnant and of course um, Elisa's response to that was initially okay but she processes things and then she gets emotional and she thinks well what if it's another little girl and of course that was a little bit problematic and then she was relieved to, to hear it was a boy so that was okay we're back we're back on track <laughs> and then uh, still the princess <laughs> yeah exactly then we have a I take her out to discuss it chatting to her and it was a heavy conversation she's like well, he's not going to be my brother, really, is he? He's not going to look anything like me, you know. And, and so she was quite, quite nasty, a little bit nasty in one sense, and she laughs about it now. But uh, at the time, I think... The How old was she? Yeah, almost 17. Just coming through the 16s. Yeah, 17-ish. Yeah. So, yeah, a little bit irrational and uh, not happy that I'm expecting her to call Joseph brother. Well, he's not going to be my brother, is he? You know, this kind of reaction. So we've gone back to, you know, it's the, it's the ups and downs. So we're at a down now. I just lovingly tell her, you know, this boy is going to change your life. He's going to be like your best friend. You're going to love him. She's like, no, I'm not. 
he's not even going to look like me. I mean, it's not even a rational thought, right? He's not even going to look like me. Well, that's, what, what does that matter? <laughs> you know, it's sort of quite narcissistic, isn't it? Kids are terrible, aren't they? Yeah, and this whole notion of not looking like her was just really a smokescreen for something else. You know, it's fear. At the end of the day, it's her feeling of fear that uh, this new little life form is going to somehow take away from her. And I think as fathers, as much as annoying as it is, and it is annoying, and you do get angry when you hear those kind of things said because you know it's not true. And no matter what you say, they don't believe you. You just have to reinforce the truth in as non-emotional way as possible, or, or the right emotion, shall I say, in a loving way. And so that's what I did. I just kept reinforcing, no, that's not true. The truth is this. One of the greatest myths that the Brady Bunch projected onto society is that a blended family is easy. Just add everyone together. It's far more emotional than that. And it doesn't matter if everyone lives under the same roof or not. So you're taking your older children through the journey of becoming, uh, in this case, half-brother and half-sister. How are you taking yourself through this? Think back to, gosh, it'd been a long time between drinks. So does it feel different when you're older in life with kids effectively starting again? Or does it feel the same? Well, I think my comment about youth being wasted on the young is probably... I, I really identify with that because although I enjoyed being a father as a young man, I don't think I really paid attention to what was important. And so this for me was an opportunity to pay attention to the little things and be more present. And you know, in those days I had a very, uh, I still have a demanding job, but I had the kind of job that took me away and I wasn't really with the family as much, you know. And so I'd missed a lot of things. It's the day-to-day -day stuff as a dad that you notice, like I'm noticing now, you know, just spending time, quality time with them and watching how I respond to the things that they do. I hear my younger self, I think I just made, I just went with it and I wasn't very present and I was, you know, I don't think I gave my all. I gave a bit of myself. If we're all honest, we've all pursued career and self and sacrifice things that actually matter. But we don't all get this chance to literally start over and do it again. And I don't want to start over, but I do want to be better. Would your older children look at you now with a sense of, gee, Dad, wish you were like that with us? It's always a thought that goes through my mind. I'm always thinking about it. I've never, I've never vocalised it, but I'm always thinking, gee, my kids must think, wow, you didn't treat me like that. You know, not that I tre treat them badly, it's just that I'm obviously much more present. And I especially feel bad for my son, Harrison. Um, I haven't really talked much about him. His sort of teenage years, he was very, um, very easy. Because he was so easy, he probably got less attention. I, f I always felt like I needed, as a father, as my first son, and as a younger man, I didn't give him all of the tools that he needed. Because quite frankly, I was, self-obsessed uh, you know with my work and what you know my career and actually most men don't really know who they are to their mid-30s and that's certainly the case for me um, it's uh, probably my late 30s in my case and so yes I often think that nobody's vocalized it nobody said that but it's something I'm very cognizant of do you feel like you're trying to make up for lost time in any way with the kids? Yeah, I have to remind myself that I've done a lot for my children, my first children, put them through private school, and they know that I've done my best for them. But it's, it, you know, to any father who, you know, has a little bit of success, I didn't have a great deal of success, but I had a little bit of money to be able to do some of those things. Actually, those things aren't the things that count. The things that really count is the quality time. If I could change anything, this is what I would do. Me and Harrison would go away together. Right. Not with Alicia, who, who obviously, couldn't you tell from this conversation, is the loud one, is the more demanding. And it's like when you, you have a nest and you have, a, you, have a chick, you have the chicks in the nest, the one that makes the most noise gets fed the most. And it's a little bit like that. And if she's a girl, daddy's girl, and all the rest of it. If I could change anything, I would balance things out a bit more. And I would actually spend more time with my son. Actually, recently we went to South Africa together and stuff. It was really good. And I, I just thought to myself, why didn't I do that sooner? Okay, so let's get real. What can we do differently or change? There are things right now that I want to start, stop, and continue. I think if we're all honest with ourselves, 
we all can be self-absorbed, even if we think it's for the right reasons. I think where there are two phases to life, and whether you're a father in the first phase or the second phase, it makes no difference. The first phase is about testing, for want of a better word, your own wineskin, your own who you are, your ability, what you stand for, what you're capable of. And I think in those early days, you build an ivory tower. You, you're doing it out of good faith. You think that's who you are. And you build these things. Hey, look what I'm doing. Look what I've done. And I think I was I was on that journey of testing my wineskin to know that to, to just to find out who I am, to be able to be awake to what I am. I think it's natural to do that in your first first phase of life. But there is a point, and not everyone crosses over into the second phase of life. But when you do, you realise things that you are the, the ivory tower that you're climbing is probably the wrong. You're probably putting your ladder up against the wrong wall quite often, we quite, quite often are. And in my case, because the ivory tower was brought down through divorce, you know, through tragedy, I was able to, and not, not everyone can do this, I was able to rebuild and reassess and maybe put the ladder up against the right wall this time, which I feel, I never know, 10 years there might be another ladder. I hope not, uh -huh. or another wall rather. No, but seriously, I feel like you know, we, the second phase of life is different in that you approach things from not from the immediate point of self, but from actually what you can do for others. And I feel that transition now. So if you can't go back in time and make the change, or if you're a dad who doesn't get uh, another chance like you have, make sure your ladder's up against the right. Yeah, I think, I think if you're humble enough, you can change, you can change course. You listen to older people, or people who've been through experiences like I have, you can make adjustments, you can make changes. You know, If I had listened to this previously, I probably would go away and spend more time with Harrison. Those simple things are possible to do, you just need to schedule them in, irrespective of you're finding out who you are, what you are, building your ivory tower, whatever, it doesn't matter, you can still fit those things in. I was relieved to hear I can do it all. It's not that I need to be a perfect father instead of a workaholic father, it's that my kids need me, and they need to see me fulfilled, and it's my job to make time for it all. My, my faith has definitely had a, had a big influence. I've never really fully identified with being a Christian necessarily, but I've always identified with being a follower of Christ, if that makes sense. I love the, the idea of who Jesus was, how he lived, and uh, the, the whole church thing, there's this, this you can tell I'm struggling with well, this let me question. Break it down. <laughs> let me ask some more direct questions. Yeah. Does faith play a part in how you raise your children? Would you like to role model to your kids some of the good qualities that you think exist in Jesus, not necessarily the church? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think that's where my struggle is. I think that I think the church is great. I think it's it's great for the kids to be together and the sense of community. It's not a it's not a church bashing thing. I just found that um, within the Christian context, there's a, a very strong focus on Jesus, which is wonderful because he, he's my idol, if you like. But it's only in later life, actually, I've kind of sort of started thinking about the Father in that context. And I, you know, in, in, in the Christian faith, you have the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. One of the shifts for me is, although obviously Jesus is a fatherly figure, there is something about I identifying with the father and I think in the Christian context of church it's very I hope it's okay to say this but it feels like a very um even the things we say the it's a very feminine approach to worship and putting your hands up and it's all it all feels a bit a bit feminine right and so he's it, always struggled with that kind of sense of how the Christian church and how dogma presents the father it all feels a bit wet and a bit pathetic and and it's, it's it's not very it doesn't feel very strong a strong sense of fatherhood and I, the reason why i struggle with answering the question does faith play a role in being a father yes it does but it didn't at first and actually i don't think it was very helpful at first i think it was i think it was unhelpful and it's only in later life that i feel like i get it now 
because it's not based on dogma, it's not based on tradition, it's not based on this and that. I've thrown all that away, I've discarded it all. I'm going to a church that has all that. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with that. You, you know, you need a basis, a framework, I get it. But there's so much more. And the unpacking those things now for me has meant that yes, 100% faith undoubtedly has a massive, uh, is, is part of who I am. But I would say in my early life it didn't. Switching gears just for a second. With, with A21, when you see the things that you see globally, how does that play into your fears as a father for your own kids? Yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. We, we, do, we do encounter things that are beyond horrific, honestly. Being completely honest, yeah. I don't feel like it affects how I view my children. and um, You don't get extra protective of them? Because no, you see stuff? not really. No, not really, because I think I already was protective of them initially, and I was already f- aware of it. And I already knew that there was terrible evil in the world. There's also a lot of good in the world as well. And I think if you surround your children with the right people and, you know, you speak the right words over them, they'll be, they'll be fine. If I took every case that we're involved in and I put that through my own personal experience, I think I'd be an absolute nervous wreck. I mean, look, there are things that it does affect, actually, in the decisions we make. I'm wise about what communication I put out to the world. Hey, I'm staying such and such. I don't document what I do. Whereas in my younger days, probably wasn't as wise. So yes, I, I, but I, I feel that, that what we put in place is enough to protect us. Great. Christian Elliott, thank you for your time. Pleasure, pleasure. That was Christian Elliott with his take on fatherhood both times. We don't all get a second chance to do it again. And while we may be racing ahead to create a life for our family, we do need to take time, as the kids aren't little for long. While it sounds like we have to have it all together, our work to build, to provide, it seems to me knowing who you are is a key to becoming a better dad. I hope that you gain some valuable ideas and tips, and I would love you to join me as I continue to chat to fathers, expanding my dad skills and navigating my way through fatherhood. The hardest thing in fatherhood is changing a really dirty nappy. But you went back for more. <laughs> That's love. Yeah, I know, it is. It is completely. And that doesn't get any, any easier, the, the more experience. Is that something that you're older now, you're wiser, the nappy is better? I still have a really bad gag reflex. I just can't control it. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> but I still do it. Thank you to the show's producer and editor, Loretta Farrell, and to Christian and Shabo for letting us interrupt their family holiday down under. I'm Brett Farrell, and this is Fatherhood. <laughs>